Welcome to Eagle's Nest. This is the former summer home of William Cassam Vanderbilt II. Here he is in this portrait. He was a great grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who made a huge fortune in shipping and railroads in the 19th century. But the man who lived here made a name for himself at the beginning of the 20th century. He was a racing car driver. He held the world record and he built the first concrete motorway in the world built expressly for automobile traffic and this was the Long Island Motor Parkway. The whole point of it was to get the American car manufacturers to compete with the Europeans because by this time the Germans and Italians were producing powerful cars and motor racing was a way of testing and improving the automobile. And originally they raced on the turnpikes, but owing to fatalities, this was stopped. And he then built the Long Island Motor Parkway, which was 50 miles long. It went from Flushing to Lake Ronkonkoma. And they raced on part of it around Garden City. But uh, for the first time, the public could pay a toll and there was limited access, no intersections, an uninterrupted drive along the motor parkway. And there were no police giving speeding tickets, which was useful for the bootleggers in the 1920s. And he tried to take it all the way to Riverhead, but of course, if people didn't want to sell him the land, they weren't obliged to. So he completed just 50 miles. And of course, all that's left of it today is a 15 mile stretch called the Vanderbilt Motor Parkway that runs from Lake Ronkonkoma to Dix Hills, and a bicycle trail in Queens that goes from Alley Pond Park to Cunningham Park. In the portrait, you see Mr. Vanderbilt wearing the uniform of Lieutenant Commander in the US Naval Reserve. He had a master's license, and there was no limit to the tonnage of an ocean-going vessel that he was fully qualified to command in any of the oceans in the world. And behind him you see his last yacht, the Alva, named for his mother. And uh, he sailed this yacht uh, collecting marine specimens, which you will find in the exhibit areas here at Eagle's Nest. The painting shows him in Florida. He owned uh, Fisher Island just off Miami Beach. And of course, besides Eagle's Nest, there was a townhouse in Manhattan and a couple of hunting lodges and a farm in Tennessee. So he lived here at Eagle's Nest, usually from May to October. Let's go into the house. These doors were all hand carved in Spain. On the back of the door, you'll notice there are scallop shells in ironwork. And these walls are fossiliferous limestone. You can see traces of shells and fossils in the stone. The staircase over here, 18th century Flemish. But the balcony above was made in the United States to match. Mr. Vanderbilt came to Centreport in 1910. He had a townhouse on Fifth Avenue and he had a summer home at Lake Success where he lived with his wife and his three children. But he was looking some, for somewhere beside the water. So he bought 43 acres of land here at Centreport. And since he and his wife separated that year, originally there was just a little cottage here. The front door originally was right here, but the wall of the house was extended 
to make room for this staircase. And uh, his bedroom was originally above. Well, it was torn down and that balcony was made here in the United States to match the 18th century Flemish staircase. Another wing was added on in 1922 for a bigger and better master bedroom. Also, guest wings were added on in the early 20s. In 1927, he remarried. Another wing was built for mother-in-law and the stepchildren. And then uh, later on, the memorial wing was built in 1936. Over here, you see portraits of Mr. Vanderbilt's parents. This is his father, William Cassan Vanderbilt I. And up above, you see his mother, Alva Smith, who came from Mobile, Alabama. She was the daughter of a wealthy cotton broker, but her family lost all their money during the Civil War. And when the war was over, she and her sister came to New York looking for rich Yankee husbands. And Alva married a grandson of the richest man in the entire country, Cornelius Vanderbilt. But it was the marriage to Alva that moved the Vanderbilts up into high society. Mrs. Astor and the old money, the Knickerbocker families, looked on them as nouveau riche. But nobody snubbed Alva. She was from the Old South. She'd spent the war years in Europe. Her family were entertained at the French court. She felt the Vanderbilts had a duty to build houses in America that would equal what she'd seen in Europe. She despised the brownstone row houses that the Knickerbocker families lived in. Very ugly and bourgeois, she said. So she commissioned Richard Morris Hunt, the architect, who'd studied in Paris at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. He built her a magnificent French chateau on Fifth Avenue, and uh, it's no longer there. Top of the Sixes stands where it used to be, but it was in the Gothic style. It had a ballroom that held 1,200 people, outdoing Mrs. Astor's 400, and Alva threw an extravagant housewarming masquerade ball with her title friends as guests of honor. And of course, Mrs. Astor and all the other society ladies left their calling cards acknowledging Alva because they couldn't miss the ball. And so uh, Alva really never looked back after this. On the south shore of Long Island is her summer home, Idlow, at Oakdale. It's Dowling College today. And at Newport, Rhode Island, her summer cottage, Marble House, which is anything but a cottage. If you're familiar with it, well, it's a palace and her brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law, uh, not to be outdone, they built equally grand summer houses and Fifth Avenue mansions and expensive yachts in which they sailed around the world. They were entertained by the King of England, the Tsar of Russia, Indian Maharajas. The term conspicuous consumption was actually coined to describe this third generation of Vanderbilts. So he grew up along with his elder sister and his younger brother. They grew up just like the little princes in Europe. And there's a portrait above the door that shows him aged six. Over here, there's a Chinese gong, Han Dynasty. Let's go into the dining room. This is the dining room. The floor comes from Portugal, 17th century Portuguese tiles, and also the tiles that surround the fireplace. And that's the family coat of arms painted on the chimney piece. The motto is a quotation from the Odes of Horace, and it translates as honor before expediency. The ceiling, which looks 17th century, was made for Mr. Vanderbilt in the 1920s, and it's hand-carved Florida Cypress. The paintings are 18th century Spanish. Over here you see the coat of arms of Ferdinand and Isabella. And the furniture in the dining room is 17th century, and it comes from monasteries and churches in Spain and Italy. The piece at the back once held priests' vestments, and the candlesticks on it are Venetian altar candlesticks. And this piece over here is an arms counter. Underneath the food, there are slots where, once upon a time, people drop money for the poor. 
and beyond those doors, the butler's pantry. The kitchens are below, and the food came up by electric dumbwaiter. And there's a buzzer here to call for the next course. Follow me to the butler's pantry. Uh, this is the butler's pantry where the food was kept warm. Uh, there are kitchens on the floor below, but the food came up by an electric dumbwaiter and was kept warm here in the pantry and from here taken to the dining room. Just off the butler's pantry is a little spot where the housekeeper worked on her menus and accounts. This is the servant's sitting room. There was a staff of about 30 employed on the estate, most of whom lived out. However, some of them lived here and this is where they would come in their free time to relax. This is the Northport porch, originally an open porch, but it was glassed in around 1930, and we're overlooking Northport Bay, uh, the narrow land that we see in front of us, that narrow piece of land is Asherokan, beyond it Long Island Sound and Connecticut on the horizon. And the table here on the porch, which was used for informal meals, uh, is a 17th century Italian made of a single piece of walnut. And there's a photograph over here taken around 1928 before the memorial wing was built. But it shows the nine hole golf course that was here, uh, the saltwater swimming pool which had two cabanas. And then here you see the road that goes down to the boathouse. At the top you see the Marine Museum. It was only one story at that point. But we've heard that when the second story was added, Mr. Vanderbilt would tee off when he played golf with his friends. In this section of the porch, you see souvenirs brought back from Mr. Vanderbilt's travels around the world. He toured Europe and North Africa by car in the early 20th century. He sailed the world many times in the 20s and 30s in his own yachts, which he captained himself and he flew his own plane around South America in the 1930s. Since most Americans didn't get to see these places, he wrote books describing his travels. And on the walls here, you see Polynesian war clubs and paddles, Persian firearms. This is a shield made of elephant hide. And a lot of the furniture in this sitting room was originally on board one of his yachts. We call this the Portuguese sitting room paneling and fireplace from Portugal. The fireplace is limestone with marble faces set in representing crusaders. The date on it is 1494. The desk is 18th century French and the desk and most of the furniture here was originally on board Mr. Vanderbilt's last yacht, the Alva. He gave it to the Navy at the outbreak of World War II so the furniture was then put in this house. Over here you see two small chairs which were samples made by craftsmen in the 18th century. They could then travel with these small pieces, showing them to their customers. And we'll move on to the guest wing. This wing was added on in the early 1920s to accommodate guests. We're told that Sonia Henney was a guest in the first bedroom on the right here and each of these bedrooms has an adjoining bathroom. Uh, they're furnished in Louis the 16th style. The room at the end of the passageway the Duke and Duchess of Windsor stayed and you'll notice there are vents in the ceiling of that bedroom. Down in the basement a machine made blocks of ice and cold air was blown down through those vents 
in a system called air refrigeration. And other guests who stayed here were Fred Astaire, Douglas Fairbanks, Charles Lindbergh, Henry Ford, Frederick Duesenberg, Louis Chevrolet. The paintings are 15th century from Spain and Italy, oil painted on wood paneling. The fireplace and the paneling in this room come from an English 17th century country house. And the furniture, like this Jacobean table and the chairs, the backgammon table and the card table are French, 18th century. And there's a 19th century Philadelphia lowboy on the back wall. The photograph above it is of Willie K. Vanderbilt II in his 50s. And then on the other side, you see him in his 20s. And again on the table, there's a photograph of him as a little boy, around six. Over here, there are three photographs. There's young Willie K. with one of his racing cars. This is his grandmother, Maria Louise Kassam. That's where his name came from, William Kassam Vanderbilt II. He was named for his grandmother. And this is his sister, Consuelo. She's about 20 years old, all dressed up for the coronation of the King of England, Edward VII, Queen Victoria's son. When Consuelo was 18, her mother married her off to the Duke of Marlborough. And Consuelo then went off to live in the most splendid residence in all of England, Blenheim Palace. And it was a very unhappy marriage. It lasted about 12 years or so, but the Duke was $15 million the richer for marrying her, and she gave him two sons, the heir and spare, to carry on the line. But although they divorced, she is buried now in the parish churchyard near Blenheim, and her grave's near that of Winston Churchill, who was her, her husband's cousin. And she and Churchill were close friends all their lives. Now, on this side of the room, you can see that the room was built especially to house this organ, which is a typical millionaire's toy of the era, a 1926 Aeolian duo art pipe organ, which means it plays automatically as well as manually. We have over a hundred music rolls and it can play 10 tunes one after the other. And when the organ is played, we usually roll up that tapestry to reveal the pipes that are behind the wall going all the way down to the basement, over 1,400 pipes. And the tapestry is 18th century Flemish, the clock, 18th century French. And over here you see a bishop's throne that comes from France. It was once in Willie Kay's childhood home, Idlauer at Oakdale. There's a particularly beautiful carpet in this room, a Persian carpet. Often a family would work for many years on a piece like this, but there was always a deliberate flaw because only Allah creates something perfect. Right. This is the yellow guest bedroom, and the paneling is 18th century French. There are seascapes painted in shades of bluish gray over the doors and the window. And over here, you see a portrait of Willie K. Vanderbilt II, aged 47. This was painted in 1925, and you see here that he was handsome as well as rich and he lived a bachelor life here for 17 years. His first wife was Virginia Graham Fair, the daughter of one of the Comstock Load Silver Kings. So she had millions of her own. Uh, they separated in 1910, around the time Mr. Vanderbilt came to Centreport. And because she was Catholic, she wouldn't consent to a divorce. But uh, in 1927, he did obtain a divorce and he remarried. But uh, with Virginia, there were three children and there are photographs of them over here and small. 
two daughters, Muriel and Consuelo, one son, Willie K. Vanderbilt III. Here's a photograph of the girls as teenagers around 1920. Here's the adjoining bathroom. Uh, what's interesting here are panels of bookmatch marble. The marble is sliced and then opened like the leaves of a book, so you get a reflecting design. Here's the master bedroom, furnished in French Empire style. Mr. Vanderbilt obviously admired Napoleon. There's a bust of Napoleon over on his desk. Uh, the bed is said to be a reproduction of Napoleon's campaign bed with the faces on the headboard modeled on the Empress Josephine. On the table here in the center, you see bookends, eagles, that are reputed to have belonged to Napoleon. And the photograph shows him as a little boy with his mother, his eldest sister Consuelo, and his younger brother Harold. Harold was a famous yachtsman who won the America's Cup three years in a row and nobody's broken his record. There are two of Mr. Vanderbilt's yachts in the paintings each side of the bed. He had at least 12 during his lifetime. The rondelle on the ceiling was done by Italian craftsmen brought here especially, and it shows elements of nature, stars for the sky, shells for the sea, and flowers to represent the earth. Well, here's Mr. Vanderbilt's bathroom, and notice the design on the floor. It's done in several different colored marbles set in sterling silver, with a matching marble surround to the hand basin, marble paneling, there's a button here if he needed anything when he was in the tub. Well, Mr. Van Bilt just had to touch the button. And every night, we've been told, an open bottle of champagne, bottle of water, and one of Coca-Cola were placed in the bathroom in case Mr. Van Der Bilt was thirsty during the night. And notice there are attractive underwater paintings in the paneling over the doors. And if Mr. Van Der Bilt preferred a shower, here is a shower. Uh, there's a faucet down here for testing the temperature. And then uh, the shower could be adjusted so that a jet spray comes from these bars in the side panels. And there's a curtain rail just inside for a shower curtain. Here's a painting of Mr. Vanderbilt's last yacht, the Alva, named after his mother. It was the most powerful and luxurious yacht in the world when it was built in the late 20s. Over 260 feet long, and he sailed all around the world in it. And this is the yacht he gave to the Navy at the outbreak of World War II. It was renamed the SS Plymouth, and it patrolled the East Coast, sunk by a U-boat off the coast of North Carolina in 1943. Here you see another painting of the Alva. Mr. Vanderbilt was a master seaman. There was no limit to the tonnage of an ocean-going vessel that he was fully qualified to command in any of the oceans in the world. Originally, this was the end wall of the house. This was a window just like that. But Mr. Vanderbilt remarried in 1927, so more rooms were added on for his new bride. This is a breakfast gallery. Here's where they had breakfast. Usually, Mr. Vanderbilt would get up early and play a round of golf. Uh, then when his wife rose, he'd join her here at this Georgian table on the balcony of their private suite. Uh, her two children from her first marriage were over in the other wing with their grandmother. And the paneling in the breakfast gallery was made for the house. It doesn't come from elsewhere. It's bleached pickled pine. This is Mrs. Vanderbilt's boudoir, which of course is a sitting room as well as bedroom. She might have afternoon tea here with her daughter or her mother. Uh, the paneling is 18th century French, and over in the corner there's a false door because, of course, the room was built around the paneling rather than the paneling designed for the bedroom. And uh, over here, 
you see a sketch of Mrs. Vanderbilt that was done during a cruise to Tahiti. Her maiden name was Rosamond Lancaster, and her first husband was Barclay Warburton. She and Mr. Vanderbilt married in 1927, and her two children grew up here. She and Mr. Vanderbilt had no children together, but she traveled all around the world with him. And she died three years after him in 1947. So the house has been open now to the public since 1950. Well, this is Mrs. Vanderbilt's dressing room. And of course, she had a lady's maid who helped her dress and who did her hair, took care of her clothing. Uh, what looks like marble here is painted wood called faux marble. But here in the bathroom, you can see the real thing. A solid marble bathtub, uh, rose-colored marble from Italy, and brass faucets, not gold plate, as people have been told. In the corner, there's a little room for the commode with scales built in that she could read the dialect. This is Mrs. Vanderbilt's clothes closet. And of course, she was named one of the 20 best dressed women in the world. It was her maid who climbed up and down this ladder, putting her hats away up in those closets, her shoes over here, her gowns, which came from Paris in this closet. And since she only lived here during the summer months, I presume there was an even bigger closet in Manhattan for her furs and tweeds and cashmere. Over here is a portrait of Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was born in 1794 at what was originally the Dutch colony of New Dorp on Staten Island. He was the fifth generation of his family in this country. They were farmers from Utrecht in the Netherlands who came to America in the 17th century. And they came from a place called De Bilt. The name originally was Artsen, and they were from the Bilt. He began as a boy of 16, ferrying farm produce and passengers from Staten Island to Lower Manhattan. And of course, that was the beginning of the Staten Island Ferry. With the profit from the ferry, while still a teenager, he bought steamboats and he sailed around Long Island, up to New England and up the Hudson River, earning the nickname of Commodore, which stayed with him for the rest of his life. Later on, during the gold rush, he took people from New York to California. They went by way of Nicaragua, cutting three days off the previous fastest time to do the journey. And he would usually put the competition out of business by lowering the standard of service or cutting wages, whatever it took to put them out of business or make them sell to him. In his 60s, he began buying up the railroads as a way of improving his shipping business. He consolidated them, founding the New York Central Line, and there's a statue of him outside Grand Central Terminal. By the time he died at 83, he controlled the biggest share of the railroads in the United States, and he left $106 million when the US Treasury held just under 100 million. And 90 million of that went to his eldest son, William Henry Vanderbilt, the next portrait. William Henry Vanderbilt only outlived his father by eight years but he turned the 90 million he inherited into 200 million, when the average income for a family of four was around $200 a year. But this is the man who turned the original Madison Square Garden into a sports arena. He was a founder of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and when he and his friends were unable to get a box for the opera season at the Academy of Music, well, they got together and built the Metropolitan Opera House. And the circle they sat in was called the Diamond Horseshoe because, of course, the ladies had such magnificent jewelry. Most of William Henry's money he left to his two eldest sons, 68 million to Cornelius II, his eldest, 
and 65 million to Willie K. Vanderbilt, the first, the father of the man who lived here. He was the second son. So this, of course, brings us to the Gilded Age, the Vanderbilts that I talked about earlier. It was Cornelius II, the eldest son, who built the breakers at Newport. And his townhouse stood where Bergdorf Goodman is today on Fifth Avenue, an entire city block in size. There was a third brother, Frederick, who built the mansion at Hyde Park, New York. And the youngest brother, George Vanderbilt, built the largest private residence in the entire United States, Biltmore in Asheville, North Carolina, a castle with over 250 rooms. The sisters, of course, were all married off to titles in Europe or American millionaires, names like Whitney, Webb, Sloan, men that could keep them in the style they'd been brought up. And when Willie Kay I died, he left 21 million to his son who lived here. He died in 1944, leaving 36 million, but 30 million of that went in taxes when he died. Now we're in the trophy room of the Memorial Wing. Over here, you see a portrait of Willie K. Vanderbilt III, the only son of the man who lived here. This painting was copied from a photograph taken on a trip to Africa in 1931. And all the hunting trophies in this room, this young man brought back from Africa. Sadly, two years after this trip, in 1933, Mr. Vanderbilt's son was killed in a car accident driving up from Florida to New York. He was only 26 years old, he was unmarried, and of course his father was heartbroken. He built this wing, calling it the Memorial Wing, in memory of his son, and put his son's hunting trophies here in this room. And in his will, he left the entire estate to the public for their enjoyment and education. The dioramas here representing the African plains were worked on by the same people who made the dioramas in the Natural History Museum in Manhattan. Over here we have a Nile crocodile and these are Maasai shields made of ostrich hide. Also we have ivory tusks and a Cape buffalo. Here we are in the clock tower. Let's take a look at the room where Willie Kay's son would stay when he visited his father during the summer. We're now in the clock tower bedroom and it's Spanish in style and we've been told Mr. Vanderbilt's son as a young man liked to stay in this room. This was his room and uh, notice the floor is in antique Spanish and Portuguese tiles and the furniture is Spanish. Uh, over here, you see a 500-year-old niche that comes from Portugal. We don't really know what was placed inside it. Maybe we'll find out one day. Uh, in the center of the ceiling, you see a 17th century Spanish door panel. As you can see, this room is very much in the style of the dining room coffered ceiling, corner fireplace, tiled floor. Over here are photographs of Willie K. Vanderbilt II and his first wife, Virginia, the mother of his son. Uh, the young man grew up with his mother, but would come and spend summers here with his father. This is the Moroccan court, originally, uh, an open courtyard, very authentic Portuguese Moroccan. There are 17th century ceramic tiles from Portugal and the others are Spanish. And there's a fountain over here. Let's take a look at the library. There's a beautiful Persian carpet in the library, paneled pine walls and an 18th century partner's desk. The rent table also is 18th century. 
and there's an 18th century English painting over the fireplace, a silk Tibetan hanging on the near wall here. We're now in the Marine Museum on the first floor. It was built in 1922 and it contains the collections of fish that Mr. Vanderbilt brought back from his many voyages in his yachts. Uh, fish from the Atlantic, the Caribbean, the South Pacific. Before the fish were mounted, his curator, Mr. Bolanski, would paint them in their lifelike colors. He accompanied Mr. Vanderbilt on his voyages, and when the fish were still alive, he made watercolor paintings to record their colors. And afterwards, uh, they were worked on to look as they did underwater here in the museum. And on the wall at the back, is a 2,000 pound manta ray that Mr. Vanderbilt wrestled with for several hours in the Bahamas in 1915. Finally, he was able to uh, bring it on board his yacht. Here on the second floor, there are many species of fish uh, preserved in distilled water and alcohol. Originally, Mr. Vanderbilt preserved them in formaldehyde, but of course it has all been changed. One of the most interesting things here is this diving suit, which was used when Mr. Vanderbilt and the people who worked with him dived in the Caribbean and the South Pacific, looking for shells and interesting species at the bottom of the ocean. Thank mm -hmm. you.